so now uh, for once a, once a month we do an offering um, and we'll, we'll go ahead and pass the plate around. We usually do that once a month. So thanks for uh, praying and getting this class uh, started. Praying for the blessing of this class. Praise the Lord. itself. It speaks so clearly and plainly. Uh, oftentimes when we think it's that case, it's because we're misunderstanding or not understanding what the Bible is saying. Uh, yes, and Brother Casey is correct. He says the Bible is infallible. Uh, God's word is infallible. In being not. Fallible means able to fail. So he's not able to fail. It is infallible. God's word will never fail. If his word fails, then we know that this world is going to be in pieces. But in fact, his word is infallible and his word was set up before we were ever born. So... God's word will never pass away, right? Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away. And he says, but, he says, but my word shall not pass away. It also says that we will be judged in the end by his word, right? You're correct. What she just added there, that's, that's interesting too. Uh, because I actually mentioned that in this PowerPoint. Uh, that's awesome. That's what I'm going to be talking about. Interesting you mentioned that. Are you ready? One, two, three, let's go. Oh, 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 before I start here, um, every time I get started and teach something, I often start adding all these extra things that ends up uh, being a lot more than what I was initially wanting to talk about, but that's what this class is going to kind of be about. So there's going to be, there's a separation between these two here. The one on the left here is the Old Testament. The one on the right here is the New Testament. Okay? So we have the book of Isaiah and the book of Matthew. They're about 800 years apart in time. About 800 years apart. Some say 750. Some say 780. Generally speaking, we're going to say 800. That's an approximate. So there's about 800 years apart between these two books here. In the book of Isaiah, God is speaking... Uh, and and is, is speaking in, in prophecy of things that are to come. And so that's being shared in the book of Isaiah, spoken to the man of God. And this is in the Old Testament. Okay? And this is prophecy for the things that are to come. So obviously in the book of Isaiah, you have the prophet writing these things that are to come. And those things are held on to until the fulfillment of those prophecies in Jesus. Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophecies written in the book of Isaiah. Now, if you forget these and you go right into the book of Matthew, and then if you just read the book of Matthew, you really don't know who this man is, this man called Emmanuel, right? So if you get rid of the book of, of uh, Isaiah, the prophecies of old are not mentioned, right? If you get rid of the book, so that means you don't know who this new person is. But because there are prophecies said in the book of Isaiah and other places, you hold on to those prophecies. And in this case, 800 years until the fulfillment of those prophecies in the book of Matthew, as mentioned in the book of Matthew. Right. So, in the book of Matthew, you know that Jesus is fulfilling of the prophecies in the book of Isaiah. And the book of Isaiah gives us an understanding and a knowledge of those things that are, are come to pass in the book of, of, of Matthew. And it's important to, 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 to explain that the Old Testament is important. A lot of people will say, we need to get rid of the Old Testament. We need to say that the Old Testament is something that's not important. But if we don't have the Old Testament, how are we supposed to prove the New Testament? Right, right. You notice in the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, you notice that the Old Testament oftentimes prophesies things that are fulfilled in the New Testament. 
You talk, you're talking about the James? Oh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Uh, talk, you're talking about the year 1611. Got it. Um, this is written, that was written before 1611. King James Version is what you're referring to in 1611. That's when it was translated into English from Hebrew and Greek. Obviously, translated to English for purposes of reading and understanding what it was, how it was written. Right, in the, in the book of Isaiah, it was written in Hebrew. Uh, the book of Matthew was written in Greek. Yeah. Uh, the King James Version. King James was a person that allowed the translators to do their work and translate the material from its original language into English. That's what, we're, that's what you're referring to. Yes, that's why we have our Bibles in English. Is that clear? Yeah. Good. Awesome. <coughs> Interesting. Uh, so I went ahead and I added... Uh, and I, I'll get there in a minute, but the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, says, therefore, therefore meaning what? Yeah, perfect. Right, okay. Okay. Therefore means after that reason. So if something happens after that, let me explain. This is the result of that. Right? Oh yeah, you can do that. If, if, you, if you're reading, therefore, you understand. This is the end of something. This is, this, is, I'm ex this is explaining something. So you can jump backwards into the text in order to understand what it's saying, therefore, for. Because of that. Therefore, because of that. Because of that, this. Yeah. Therefore, the Lord himself... The Lord himself, not themselves, himself, okay, referring to the singularity here. The Lord himself shall give, the Lord himself shall give you a sign, behold, a virgin shall conceive, what is that? Conceive. That's not, she, she didn't get, she wasn't conceived from a man, she was conceived from the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost filled her as she conceived, understand? This, and bear a son, that, that son had no earthly father. That son was God. We, here on earth, have earthly fathers, flesh, fathers that are, that are born of the flesh, right? We all do, there was only one person that did not, and that was Jesus Christ. His father was not Joseph. His father was God being manifested in the flesh as Jesus. That's who the son was. Okay? Uh, so a, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Who is that son? Oh, yes, you're right. You're right, Jesus. Perfect. Class is over. You got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And the scripture continues here, and shall call his name Emmanuel. What does that mean? Yeah, okay. Yeah, obvious. Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. God with us. That's Emmanuel. Emmanuel is God with us. It's, there's no separation of the Son and, oh, and God is with us. No, no, no. The Son is God with us. Talking about Christ? Oh. Christ means the anointed one. Christ is the anointed one. He was doing special work. He was the anointed one. That is Emmanuel. God with us. That's what Emmanuel translates to. It translates to God with us. Now, this is written down. This is unchanged. You go 800 years into the future on that timeline, and you get to the book of Matthew. Book of Matthew 1, 
chapter or chapter one, verse twenty-three says, "Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, being interpreted, is God with us." Which being interpreted right means this. So you notice Emmanuel, and then in the New Testament, and then I in the Old Testament, you do have to understand the E and the I, it's the same thing, right? It's the same thing. But this is written in Hebrew, and this is written, Emmanuel is written as such, and Emmanuel in the Greek is written as such. It's the same thing. Right, which being interpreted is God with us. You're right. You're right. Okay. We done with this? Okay. So now we know who God, uh, Jesus is. Now we know. Right. Bring forth is, bring you're talking, bring forth is to, to give birth. Bear a son, bring forth a son. It's the same, same idea, right? It says, bring forth a son is the same thing as bearing a son. And that son does not have an earthly father. Because he eventually needs to go to the cross for our sins. If this son had an earthly father, this man could not die for us. Could not die for our sins. Because all men have sinned. Right? All men have sinned and Therefore, if he had an earthly father, he couldn't die as a perfect sacrifice. So he had to be, as Mary had to be conceived through the Holy Ghost as a perfect being who could be who could be born onto this earth who had no sin. That's the only one who could do that or who could take that sacrifice or take that load. So Jesus now has a right to judge us. Okay. Any questions? No. Good. See that? <laughs> Your question is good. That's a good question. However, no, that's perfect. That's perfect. Your question is good. It's a good question. But you have to understand this in Isaiah something that was already written. You go 800 years into the future from this point, and then you get to what's mentioned in the book of Matthew. Jesus is born, and Jesus is the fulfillment of things that are written in the past, right? The Pharisees understood this. They knew their Old Testaments. They understood it. They know it. However, in knowing this, they then rejected Jesus, which was the problem. Uh, right, that's up to them. They were blind, right? So we look at the past and we can look down at them, right? We can very easily do that, but there's a lot of people today that are equally as blind. There's no difference, right? You can show the truth to a lot of people, and there's a lot of people who are willfully blind to the truth, right? Because this Bible says it clearly. We, it's an open book. You can read it at any point. But it's ultimately a choice to accept it, to understand it, to study it, to analyze it. Either do that or you can leave it. But you can't force people to do it, right? It is based off of human will, and God will honor that human will. Right? All you can do is say, hey, here's the book. God says, hey, this book's about me. Read it. That's all that we can do. And it's our responsibility to open it and show it. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. That's exactly right. If we work, if, if, if we act upon the word of God, people will notice that there's something different about you. Right? They'll notice these things about you. And they say, hey, there's something different about you, but that's just a, a verification of the fact that you're following what the Bible has to say. Yes. Yes. It says clearly in the Bible... Even when you go to your hotel and you open the drawer, there's a book there, right? 
People here have their Bibles. Even in the Christian bookstores, there are Bibles. Everybody has a chance, but it is up to you. For me, I want to analyze it. I want to read it. Yeah. Yes, true. This, this book is one of the top, this is one of the best selling books in the world, in history. People often say, no, 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 no. They'll take the Bible, they'll throw it away, and they'll try to find another most popular book. The problem is, it is proven. This book is the most sold book in history. It's, an, it's, it's, it's fact. You can't change it. People buy this book, and they've been buying this book for in all of its history. All right, you ready? Maybe someday I will explain a little bit about the Bible itself. We'll see. It's, it's an awesome story. Any questions you have so far? And oh, by the way, the Bible does say every knee shall bow. That means everybody. That includes going to other countries. Everybody in the whole world shall, as the Bible says, shall, you can refuse all you want, but it's going to happen anyways. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess. Everybody's going to confess this. Because at the end of the day, you know it until you see it. And then you say, wow, okay, it really is. And that's when you have to confess. So what we should do is before we have to, before we get to that point, we should be bowing our knees to the one that sits on the throne. Because eventually every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Right there. There's only one. And we aren't confessing to, to separate deities. We're confessing to the one true God. And everyone can see that. And I'll explain it here in a little bit. That's right. That's right. Every one of those Bibles, they have the same Max 238 in. You're correct. Every one of those Bibles has that, and so we should be obeying it. All right, you were, you were saying something? accept God at his word because when we accept God at his word we'll receive that revelation we can't say well you know that doesn't really make any sense let's go ahead and change let's go ahead and change that I think what it means is we should not be doing that right because when we do that we destroy the identity of God we destroy the word of God but what we need to do is to accept him at his word accept what our Bible says and that's when we can get that a revelation and understanding but it really just what we should be doing is taking God at his word and studying what this Bible says. Not what I think it should mean. Get rid of that part. Study what it says. Just like a kid asking their dad, why, 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 why? And of course the dad has to answer all these questions. But the dad never has to go through and change the point, but change anything. Just answer the question. Just like in our Bible, we should be doing it in the same way. We should be reading it, not have the source of pride saying, well, I think what it really means is we shouldn't be doing it that way. When we let pride get in the way, we'll, we'll lose it. So let's throw that pride out of the way. And if you say, oh, I know everything. No, you don't. I don't even know everything. I'm still learning. We're st we should be sharing the word of God. We should be understanding the word of God. It's beautiful. We're still learning. Right. The Bible's called the living word. Yes, that means right. It's not something we just stop learning. Right. We eat daily. We eat food daily. We need to be reading our word of God daily. Did you follow the yearly plan so far? Have you guys been following that, reading your Bibles? I've been doing so. I'm a little turtle, but I'll catch up. <laughs> yes, same. Yes, same. Yes. 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 Uh, we all have the same. They're a snail, even worse. 
But when, when you get to the end, yeah, then there you go. Slowly but surely, you'll still get there. Either if you're a snail or you're a cheetah. If you do that either way, you'll get to the end. That's good. A snail is better in some cases because you're able to digest it more. And then you go a little further and digest it a little further. If you're going as a cheetah, you know, I forgot what's said. You have to go back and research it and refine it. Yeah. Okay. And if, if you really, if you truly do love the Word of God enough, you will take your time, you will read it, you will get it. I've ha I have a lot of experience, and I know you guys might have as well. It's, the important thing is, is get all of your to-dos, the things that are in your mind. Yeah, we got some people in the ring already. All of those things that are in your mind, all the things that you need to do, and when you have that in your mind, you try to read your Bible, it's a struggle. It's, it's, it's frustrating. So what you need to do is get rid of everything and discipline yourself. Discipline ourselves and say, you know what? No. I'm going to, to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down. I'm going to read what this book has to say. And you'll notice over time, you'll just get drawn in. And you start understanding the stories in a new light. And you start hearing, and, oh, wow, Joseph and his brothers hated him. But, but Potiphar's wife lied about him. And then he goes to prison, and you start realizing that's a rich story in here. And you start getting drawn in. And my favorite thing to do is at night, get up on my chair, pull up the, the recliner, and just read the Word of God. That's my favorite thing to do. It's like a steak, juicy steak. <laughs> Yeah, some of you are already getting hungry. Let's do that. Let's start. If you have to start, let's start today. I'm way off on this rabbit trail. <laughs> Forgot where the street is, where I come off of, so I gotta go back. Are you ready for the lesson? Okay. Any questions? Okay, yes. Old Testament, New Testament. Get rid of the Old Testament. Some, some people say there's 40 or 50 different fulfillments of prophecies in the New Testament from the Old Testament. If you get rid of just this example, there are plenty of others where there are fulfillment of a prophecy set in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the New Testament. It says so very clearly. Okay. Uh, I put down a D to remind me. Um, I just wanted to add one more. This might be related to my lesson. This might be related. We'll see. Um, in 1990, before Kyle, my oldest son, was born. This is before Kyle was born. Uh, and this is right after I married my wife. Uh, we were young. This is a baby marriage. And now I'm a middle-aged marriage. <laughs> Soon we'll be getting to the old marriage. Anyways. Uh, yes, happy Valentine's Day. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, in 1990, the late 90s, no, 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 early 90s, somebody in Stockton said, hey, can you come preach for us? And I was extremely nervous. The, verse, the first verse I ever preached was out of this particular verse. Do you want to know what it is? This is the first scripture I'd ever preached from. This is the first one. I stood up. I went five minutes. I was so nervous. This is true. Daniel 12, 2. This is... Daniel 12, chapter 12, verse 2 reads, And many of them that sleep, which is speaking of who died, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. So now we know from that particular verse there are two places, not three. There are only two places to go. Up or down. Someone's hitting this wall behind me. I can feel it. Anyways. Yeah. Earthquake. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Go ahead and finish this. Uh, now we know that there are two places. Okay? There's no third place. Okay. This is in the Old Testament, right? So in the Old Testament, you have a lot of prophecies of things to come, right? Especially in the book of Daniel, right? Uh, and one of the most fascinating scripture portions of Daniel that a lot of people latch onto is the story of the lion's death, where he was thrown into the lion's death. 
Daniel was then cast into this lion. There's a story there, and, I'll, I'm, and, and we can get to it, but the lions could have easily eaten him, but they didn't. So oftentimes, people sign Daniel as far as the lion, because that's the distinguishing story. Daniel. Right. So people sign Daniel this way. But then, obviously, when Daniel came out of the den, the other ones that were fed into were eaten before they hit the ground. Yes, they were captured. Daniel was captured because the king was recommended to set a new law by some advisors, and there was some. There was, it's a long story, and the point of the story is that this law included the fact that there, he needed to be worshipped, and then Daniel apparently broke the law because he didn't worship the king, he worshipped God. So then Daniel uh, is then thrown into the lion's den as punishment, and the lions were intentionally starved. And how we know this is when Daniel's thrown in, the lions don't eat him. Because God is with him. God is with Daniel. The lions are tame. They don't do anything. Then when they pull Daniel out, the three men that were, that were accusing him, the three men that were the remain responsible people to set up those new laws, were then thrown in as punishment, and they were eaten before they hit the ground. And the lions would eat them up quick. Right. Anyways. So we know that God is truly alive. Right. God is still God is still alive. God is in control. God is in control. God knows everything. Regardless of the situation, I mean, Daniel easily could have been, to, you know, he's in the lion's and he's sleeping. He may have had his arms around the lion, scratching his face. No problem. Because he knew that God was in control. Because God truly is in control. God will take care of you. God will protect you. Anyways, in Revelation chapter 4, we're speaking about Judgment Day. Let me go ahead and share a little more. What time is it now? 1142. Someone's saying it doesn't matter. Okay. I think I'm going to keep going. I don't want to save this for next week. I want to finish this. Um, I'm going to keep going. So Revelation is the last book in the Bible. And that's what we have here in, the, in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. Revelation is very rich in symbolism. Okay. <clears throat> so you have the book of Revelation, chapter 4. And then uh, follow along with me in verse 1 here. Verse 1 says, after this, after what? John wrote this. John the Beloved. Not John the Baptist. It's a, it's a different John. It's John the Beloved, one of the 12 disciples. He wrote this particular verse of scripture. Right here it says, <clears throat> after this, after this what? It's just got done speaking about the seven churches. And he had written a letter to each of the seven churches. And that's when we come down to Revelation chapter 4. Each of the seven churches were addressed in previous chapters. Then we get to Revelation chapter 4 and we don't see those churches referred to after that point. Which obviously speaks about in... in, in Understanding that the churches are no longer there, which points to a rapture. Okay, I'm glad you asked that. This that's what this class is for. Thank you. Maybe some people will then glean from your question here. Revelation chapter four. John wrote. John wrote the Gospel of John. John one, John two, John three, and this one in the Book of Revelation. That's what John wrote. John happens uh, to be captured and thrown to the Isle of Patmos uh, because the Romans were sick of him spreading the gospel of Christ, and so as punishment they throw him to the Isle and basically leave, their, leave him there in exile. But God is showing him dreams and visions of the things that are to come while he's on that Isle. So then John writes the book of Revelation for purposes, you know, there was a plan in this that God wanted so that when John was alone, God could show him everything and, 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 and so he could write the book of Revelation. 
John was one of the 12 disciples. Not all of them went. Not all of them went to the Isle. John just happened to be one that was thrown to the Isle of Patmos. And he wrote the book of Revelations while he was there. This is important. Right. So he was thrown because he, the, the Romans were sick and tired of him spreading the gospel of Christ. And so they fought. How do we stop this? Right. They said, how do we stop this? We do it by throwing him off into an island by himself. But at this point, Jesus or God is showing him all of his visions. And so you see letters to this, letters to that, letters to this. So obviously the letters have been sending out. So obviously somehow the letters are getting out. Uh, it could have been by boat. It could have been by, yeah. Someone may have rowed there. Maybe threw a, <laughs> rode a fish. Or maybe it got spat out by a whale. Who knows? Somehow it happened. <laughs> maybe he walked, just like Jesus did. Maybe he walked on water. Who knows? Maybe the sharks underneath him were watching him walk by. Point is, is it happened. That message was then shared. But let's go ahead and focus on this. <sighs> So we notice that after Revelation chapter 4, those churches aren't referred to again, which obviously points to a rapture. So let's go ahead and look here at Revelation chapter 4. After this, after speaking of the seven churches, this is interesting. God is showing John this, and John is, is writing them down as he sees them. <clears throat> in, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it says, After this I looked, and behold. This is interesting. And behold. A door was opened. It says, and behold, a door was opened. That same door is opened here. <laughs> when that door is opened and that trumpet is sounds, we are all able then to head to our heavenly home. <laughs> if you're born again, and you're transferred into the, fat of the family of Jesus, then you know Jesus is saying, come, my family, come to your new home, and we'll celebrate in the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we'll celebrate time with Him. And your struggles are menial. They're small compared to what God has for us in heaven. So just let your problems, give your problems to Him. Okay? <laughs> After the church is raptured, there is a trial or tribulation that people have to go through. And you see it in the book of Revelations. I'll make it short here, but after the church is raptured, the world has to go through a tribulation. It's terrible. It's tough. The tribulation will not end until we come back down to finish it. Uh -huh. We come back down to end the tribulation. Then, after the millennial reign of 1,000 years, the devil who's been bound, he during that millennial reign, he bound his locked. It's not forever; it's only for a thousand years. He's locked into that place. Jesus then comes, and he is here on earth. And what's surprising in the Old Testament is so a lot of this stuff is old prophecy. Uh, prophecies in, in, in Isaiah nine and six speaks about the millennial reign. A child is born, and his name shall be wonderful, the mighty God, and the everlasting Father, the Prince of. I mean, you go on. These all these titles. That are fulfilled in Jesus. And that's going to be more so fulfilled in the millennial reign. There's not a three person deity of in control. There's that one God that will reign. Exactly. So you have to every, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You're right. And oh, should I wait until we're in his presence to do it? No, we can do it right now. We can do it at any time. As soon as we get that revelation. Uh, let's go back to this. And behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. Come up hither. For that people, well, well, what do I do? No, you can hear with your hearts. We don't need an interpreter to say, come up hither. We don't need the interpreter to do that for us. 
The deaf, it's not going to be the deaf people are going to miss rapture because they missed it because they could hear it. No, no, no. Deaf people and hearing people are just alike. Deaf people and hearing people will hear it. And it's not that deaf people will trail behind. You notice in church, all the hearing people laugh and then the deaf people will laugh. There's a little bit of a delayed response for the uh, for deaf people, and that's common, that's normal. But in heaven, that's not going to be the case. We're all going to respond to the exact same time. Okay, now. When we are, when we go back to, when we go to heaven, we go back to one language. Of course, Jesus is looking at me. He, I'm signing, obviously, in American Sign Language. He understands, because it comes from the heart. God will understand that. God understands what you're telling God, what you're speaking to. He knows. He knows you. It's one language. For deafness, we've lost our hearing, but when we go to heaven, we'll have our perfect body, so we will have that. Right? One language. We come back to one language. Right. We'll be we'll be a spirit. We're not we're not our fleshly bodies. We won't have our fleshly bodies. We work our way off, but I'm I'm way off on the rabbit trails. I need to come back and clean my shoes and get back on the street here. Okay. Go back to this. Okay, I said that already. Come up hither. And we see in the, the scripture continues here, and I will show thee things which must be here after. Which means the church is raptured. From that point forward, there's going to be a lot of things that happen. Let me show you. And we see that all after chapter 4 in the book of Revelations, and that's when John writes it. So he tries his best, and he writes, and he does everything he can, and writes it all down. Right. That's all in Revelation chapter 4. And it goes all the way down to, to, to chapter 22. Right. And that's the end of the Bible. So, <coughs> from chapter 4 to chapter 22, and that's all speaking of things to come. Basically, we're ahead of the game because we get to read what happens next. We know what the end of the book looks like. But we'll be in heaven. Right. Right. Okay, let me go back to my last one. There's one thing I want to show you. In the scripture here, it says, and behold. I want to focus on that. And behold. This is interesting. In verse 2, and immediately. I was in the spirit. This happened immediately. This, this, uh, verse 2 says, and immediately I was in the spirit. And behold. A throne. Singular. One. If you believe in the separation of deities, there should have been, behold, there are thrones. There are three thrones, or something to that extent. That's what should have been mentioned. But, and behold, a throne, just one. Then he explains what the rest of it looks like. It starts from the throne, then it goes to the rest of the, of the imagery. And behold, a one throne. This is powerful. Scripture continues, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one. Now, if there would have been more than one, there would have been more than one recognized or written about. But there was only one. So why don't we go ahead and take him at his word and understand, hey, there's one. There's a revelation in one. Amen. Yes. I'm not exaggerating. This is, what, this is what our Bible says. Amen. Exactly. Right. There you go. I like what he said. It's not a love seat. It's not a love seat where there's more than one position to sit on. Okay? It's not a couch. There's not three cushions on it. There's only one. There's only one chair, one person on it. 
Yeah. <laughs> what color is it? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> and one sat on the throne. <laughs> Then the rest is mentioned here. Make sense? Start from that one. No, the angels didn't write this. John wrote this. John, Revel in the book of Revelation, is written by John. And this is a lot of prophecies of things to come. John gets a sneak preview of what happens at the end of the at the end of the book, and then he writes about writes it down. Right? Scripture reads about being one on the throne. Obviously, we understand that you can't divide one into another number as a whole. It's one person. There's only one number. One. Then. Then. He continues, and does that make sense? So he, he mentions here, one, uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, and then number 3, verse 3, he goes into a... But you notice, he doesn't make mention of anybody else in and around the throne except for the one. And oh, by the way, let me go ahead and tell you something. From Revelation chapter 4, the first first three chapters are about the seven churches, but after Revelation chapter 4 on to the end of the book of Revelation, all the way down to chapter 22, the entirety, it speaks about the throne, the throne, a throne, throne. It says the word throne in a singular tense 36 times. It only speaks it in a singular sense. It doesn't say thrones, thrones, it doesn't say that. It, says, it speaks about the word throne 36 times. Yeah. Yes. There are other scriptures that talk about thrones, but it's speaking about the uh, 24 elders, of, and it's speaking about their thrones. That's something completely different. What we're speaking about here is the singular throne, and it speaks about it 36 times. And oh, by the way, if you go up, and you go to the beginning of the book of Revelation, we see talking about uh, the th uh, additional thrones as well. But it only says so in a singular sense. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's one throne, and that's the throne. Verse 3. And he sat, he being God. And he's, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper some say it's more like a diamond. Some say it's clear, like, like a crystal. <clears throat> Which shows how pure he is in his judgment. And a sardine stone shows his wrath. So it's red. It's representative of his wrath. Sardine. Sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round the th round about the throne, and it's bright and it's great and it's round about the throne. The throne singular again. I don't want to be standing in front of his throne in guilt, but I want to be doing so alongside him, being able to judge with him and taking him at his word while I live on earth here. Is that clear? Again, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald, which is green. You, we try to picture this imagery, we try to understand this, and it's too full, it's too much, it's hard to try to grasp everything, right? It's beautiful, it's a beautiful picture. Now we jump down, all the way down, to Revelation chapter 20. We jump down uh, to the end. Revelation chapter 20. I feel like we're probably going to go 15 more minutes. Uh, I do want to finish it today. 
Oh, oh, by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way next Sunday morning, uh, I'm going to have a little bit of a break. I'm going to go ahead and enjoy. I'm going to watch somebody else teach this class next week. I asked them. Yes. Brother Jeff. Uh, oh, yes, I plan on making him do you too. When will you? After him? Yes. Sure. I don't care. Sure. Okay. Good news. Next Sunday morning, Brother Jeff will be teaching. And then the following, it will be Kyle. Kyle will be teaching. I'm going to go ahead and join you. <laughs> Ready? Again, 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 again. You see the word throne mentioned in the singular tense 36 times. Verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne. An emphasis on that right there. A great white throne. Which is, again, is pointing towards purity. It's so only doing, and it does so in the singular tense. And him that sat on it, which is speaking about the one that sat on the throne, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Which speaks about his fina the finality of the judgment that you cannot escape. It will happen. A lot of people will try to cover their eyes and maybe blindfold themselves and say, well, I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, the Bible tells him so. In, the, in Revelation, you see it. It tells you so. Uh, I'll be done in about 10 minutes. The Bible says, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess. Which means Jesus, uh, which means that they're, they're already in a place where they should know. No. Everybody's going to know about it. Right. There's no excuse. God has given everybody a chance. And it's up to you, it's, like it's your responsibility to latch on to it. Right. You will know it. Now that's fit so clearly that we're going to face him and his judgment. We cannot escape it. I'm pulling this from the scripture here. I'm, I'm adding it there. I'm almost done. Okay. Revelation, uh, we go to, to, to verse 12. And I saw the dead. What does that mean, the dead? Any, any, anybody have an answer? No. And I saw the dead. What does that mean? What does that mean? Sin. Lost soul. Okay. The dead. No, right. Speaking about who's in, in, in the place of sin. And uh, here it says small and great. Poor and rich. Not important, important. Basically, you can put anything here. This and that. Both of these people, both ends of the spectrum, stand before God. And the books were opened. Opened. Right? It's ready to go. They're open. Jesus has a right to judge each and every person according to what's written in these books. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So 
everything that they've done is now mentioned in this book. It's written in these books. Page after page after page. Every work is written. How do you remove some of those things? Blood of Christ. The blood of Christ will wash that. And that's through being born again. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. End of discussion. you got to do this. In order to come to the family of the, of the second Adam, to the family of God, you have to be born again with his blood. Now, if your name is in the book of life, you'll be in heaven. Now, if you go to the book of man's work, you'll be facing judgment, and you cannot go. In Matthew 28, 18, I added it this morning. Okay? Okay? If you just said, oh, I'm going to accept the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior, and if you do that, and that's great. But you have to understand this. What does your Bible say about that? What does your Bible say about it? It doesn't say anything about accepting the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. So when someone tells you that, don't you don't have to necessarily follow what they say. Just go ahead and look in your Bible. If your Bible doesn't say anything about it, just know that's not true. That's, that's a man's law. That's man's law. That's not biblical. That's wrong. The Bible says you must be born again. That's what, that's what your Bible says. Is that clear? Must be born again is... Right, exactly. Exactly. What she would say, if you love to read the Word of God, you love the truth, you will find it. That who will save those that love truth. Mm -hmm. So if you love the truth and you read it, you analyze it, you're willing to obey it, and you're able, willing to act on it, then you'll, you'll find the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But you have to understand, if you truly love the truth, that will lead you to act upon it. That will lead you to read it and analyze it. And it will lead you to want to know more. Just doing that easy believism and accepting the Lord Jesus is willful ignorance. You're willfully ignoring what the Bible has to say. Because your Bible doesn't say anything about it. So you know what I mean? What do you think? You can't just, oh, hey... I'm going to follow what they say because oftentimes what they say you can't find in the Bible. And what man's word is is not above what God's word is. God's word is first. And it's ultimately up to you. You want to go to the earthly kingdom's heaven? There is no such place. Or do you want to go to the kingdom of heaven's heaven? And, and yes, they're good people. But they need to see the truth. I love them. And I love everybody. But they need to see the truth. Everybody is lost and they need to see the truth. John chapter 5, verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. The Son has a right to judge. The prophet 
Christians can't judge me. Only Jesus can judge me. I'm almost done. John chapter 12, verse 48. Uh, again, uh, John wrote this particular verse of scripture. John also wrote the book of Revelation. John writing here, speaking, and this is what Jesus said. And this is incredible. Jesus speaking says, he, meaning anybody, speaking directly to the disciples, he, he that rejecteth me, reject, like this is a sign for reject, right? We understand that. But rejecteth me is more directional, so you sign it this way. So he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. What does his word say? You must be born again. That's what his word says. Are you going to reject that? Think about it. All of his words come from this book. But you can't just say, oh, you know, the disciples, they're just speaking, you know, let me go ahead and ignore them and, 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 and just go, with them. no, no, no. Jesus says, you need to follow what these disciples say. They're doing so in my work. I can't remember exactly where in the book of John he says that. But he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Two more. Verse, yeah, that's, yeah. Verse 13. Verse 13 reads, And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them. And they, everybody, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. Verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. This is the second death. You can't come out of this one. Second death, you're here forever. And then the last verse of scripture here, verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The point of that is that there's only one throne, and that one throne is the place where one God will judge each and every one of us. But this book, if you reject it, yes, there is judgment. If you're in sin, yes, there is judgment. People write on, they have on the shirts that says only God can judge us. Yeah, that means don't judge me, only God will judge me. That's what that shirt is, what they, when they write on it, that's what they say. Yeah, yeah. That, that's up to them, that's, that's their business. All I know is, regardless of what they say or what's going on, I'm going to read this book, and I'm going to judge according to what this book tells me how to judge myself and how to... to... Right, exactly. Exactly. If this, book is mirror, this book is like a mirror. When you look into the mirror, you can see anything that's wrong with you, and you can fix it, and you can do this, you can do that, and pick some out of your teeth, and fix your hair, or whatever you can do, right? But just like that, you can do it with this book. Just like you pick things out of your teeth in the mirror, or you, you clean your face, and fix your eyebrows, or whatever, just like when you do it there, when you look at this book, this book helps you clean yourself. You say, oh, I'm not doing this right. I didn't do that right. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that. I need to fix this. I'm doing this wrong. This book will clean you up. That, this book is a mirror that you can use to look at yourself and say, oh, I'm not doing this right. I've messed that up. And then accept it. And then ah, it. Ah, ah, right? You follow what this book says. You don't follow what people will tell you and because that can lead you astray. But we need to follow what this book tells you because this book is God speaking to you. But, but, you go to a preaching and you, 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 you match it with the word of God, that's, that's the way to do it. Now, if you go in and you just say, mm -hmm, that's great, be careful then. Be careful because you don't know who a lot of these people are. 
Because your soul is at stake, and that's important. When you're, taking, when you're talking about your soul, that's precious. Someone was saying something? Yeah. Ooh, simple. Very simple. You guys are understanding. You guys are explaining it back to me very clearly. Well. That's the point. So, I am done. I love the fact that there's only one throne, and it says so in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, all the way down to verse, or chapter 22, speaking about the word. The word throne is used 36 times, and it's singular tense, only one. All right? Praise the Lord. Yes, and one book of life. There's one book of life. And yes, there's only one person that will judge. It's God, right? There's no other judger besides God. God's only on the throne, right? Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. Right. Are you talking about the book of John? 10 and 30? I'll look at it. I'll look at it. Uh, are any questions before we go? You have to remember, when he says, come up hither, speaking of, the first thing he sees is one on the throne. That's the only thing he sees. He goes and says everything else as well, but he never says anything about an additional throne. He only speaks about one throne continuously. Did you have something? A right, exactly. He does not say, I see three thrones, I see... <laughs> It says, I see a throne. And it says so in a singular tense. He's right. Young guy, he gets it. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. All right. We done? All righty. Let's go ahead and pray in closing. Let's wrap this up. All right. Brother Candido, can you pray? That was a good lesson. I learned a lot from that. I enjoyed that. And it says so clearly talking about the one throne. Uh, did you enjoy that lesson? You enjoyed it? That was good. Right. Let's go ahead and pray in closing. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you were the only one sitting on the throne. I enjoyed learning about your word. In Jesus' name, amen.